for our community for our first Faith and Reason Lecture. My name is Lola Castellino and I work here as the Associate Director of Formation and Programs at the Women's Center. I'm really very delighted to see all of you and thank you very much for your support. Um, our first lecture of Faith and Reason Lecture Series was presented by Dr. Jeanine Langan and I will introduce her shortly. But for more information about everything else, there would be a brochure that Chanel's handing out right at the back. So please take one and familiarize yourself with it. So without further ado, um, let's introduce our main speaker for today. Dr. Langan is a professor emeritus of philosophy at the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. She has written and lectured extensively on art, family, media, and the problems of Catholic education. In 2006, she was made a Lady of St. Sylvester for her contributions as the founding coordinator of the Christianity and Culture Program at St. Michael's and as a faculty at St. Augustine's Seminary. A native of France, she received her BA from Smith College, Northampton, her MBA and teaching certificates from Sorbonne and the University of Toronto, and get her PhD at the University of Toronto. In addition to her brilliant teaching qualifications, Dr. Langan is a caring mother, a beloved grandmother, and an adored great grandmother. While Chris and I were actually at the baptism of Dr. Langan's most recent great granddaughter a few weeks ago, and it was just beautiful to see how amazingly loved her family is and how amazingly loving she is to her family. In fact, her son and her daughter-in-law are right here as well. So Dr. Janine, thank you very much for ex accepting our invitation to speak and we look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Yay. Can you hear me? Am I supposed to do something with this? Can you hear me, everybody? Okay. So, I don't like talking about the church and the family. <laughs> That's the first thing I have to tell you. And the reason for that is that I find it very peculiar that the world has the general impression that the major interest of the Catholic Church is the defense of the traditional family. Why do I find that strange? Well, I find that strange because Jesus did very little to fight for a defense of the traditional family. In fact, if you know your Gospels, he says rather peculiar thing in relationship to the family. For example, Jesus, your mother and brothers and sisters are here, they want to talk to you. My brothers and sisters and mothers are the people who do the will of God. Huh. That's a little worrisome. He calls disciples. They say, oh, please, uh, wait a minute, because I want to go bury my father. Oh, let the dead bury their dead. Hmm. And you, I could go on for quite a bit. There is many, many more. Unless you, and it's translated rather stupidly, hate your father, your mother, your sister, you cannot follow me. Hmm. That's hardly a heated defense of the family. So what? So what are we doing? Why is the church so interested in defending the family? Well, I don't think the church is interested in defending the family because this defending business is not what the church is about. The church is interested in evangelizing the family in consecrating the family, in converting the family, and that's a very different process. It's very interesting that the one of Jesus 
most famous statement that we capitalize on all the time is what? What did Jesus say in defense of the family? What God has united that no man put asunder. What's he talking about? Is this a... What is this project when he says that? What is he trying to do? Well, he's trying to fight a contemporary cultural approach to the family which he considers inadequate. Hmm? And it is so scandalizing what he is saying about the family that even his disciples say, really, don't overdo it, eh? <laughs> this is a hard saying. So, I find this quite a support to my theory that what the teaching of the church about the family is, is the teaching of the church about something greater than the family, which the family needs to hear. So that's my first point. You should think about that, though, because it is extremely important for your own life as family members in the future. One of the reasons that I got clearer in my mind about this fact was the Pope's latest encyclical on the environment, supposedly. Actually, it's not an encyclical on the environment. It's an encyclical attempting to precisely convert a culture, a universal kind of a culture, which he thinks is the cause of the catastrophic situation of the environment. And in the process, he talks a lot, a lot about the family. He talks about the family as the first step towards this universal conversion, which is to help save the world at large. That's why he talks about the family. He talks about the family to tell it, come on, you have a job. And that job is not exactly to build a family. It is to be a breeding ground to be a seedbed of the kind of people that the world needs if it's going to blossom into what it is meant to be. When Christ talks about uh, let no man put asunder what God has united, he is talking literally about Adam and Eve and about the splendor of the original Adam and Eve, and the catastrophe of what follows. Because if you know your Bible, you can see that it goes pretty fast from this first moment where Adam gets ecstatic about how wonderful it is finally to have Eve around, to the point at which both of them are saying, it's his fault, it's her fault. Doesn't take very long, about what? 20 lines, and we're already there. So, it is therefore in that kind of context that I would like you to think right now about the family. The church's teaching about the family is about the grandeur of the family and about its present abuse. And the two go together. The Pope says that we are abusing the family just as we are abusing the created world. And for the same reason, we have forgotten that the world is not your oyster, 
and the family is not your cocoon. Both of them are gifts. And the problem with gifts, it's very dangerous to accept gifts. Because a real gift is something you're supposed to do something with. And doing something with your gift is exhausting. If you get a violin from your grandparents, oh no, now <laughs> you've got to learn to play this damn violin. <laughs> and before you can actually do it right, it's going to take a while. And it's the same thing with the family and with the world in general. If we idolize the world as our loot, what we can accumulate, own, conquer, possess. If we idolize the family as the ideal means to our happiness, we are deep in original sin. That is original sin. Think about that. What is then the vocation of the family according to the church? Well, its job from the very beginning, here the church has described, and this is since St. Augustine, is tripartite. First, be a sacramental son. Now, it's very interesting, this idea. What does that mean, the family should be a sacramental son? It means that by watching the family, we should get an inkling of what God is like. Because we didn't create the family, right? I mean, you can't help being involved, being a human being, built the way you are, you cannot avoid being embroiled in a family to an extent. At worst, you've got to be a child. <laughs> There's no way out of that. And most likely, eventually, most of you will be a father or a mother. And hopefully, all of us will be lovers well, it's extremely interesting. If you think about what names do we give God? What are the names of God? The names by which we describe it. Obviously, our Father, right? That's inevitable. But also, the bridegroom. How often have you seen that as keyword, not just of Christians, but of the Jews themselves already? God was the bridegroom of Israel. Christ is the bridegroom of the church. Christ is the bridegroom of the nun. Christ is the bridegroom of my soul. Where did that come from? The family. And what else? Christ is our brother. Brother. That also comes from the family. And so the fact is that people tend to project, organize their vision of God from experiences they have in the family. And if those experiences are failures, it's very hard on God. If you've had it catastrophic father, very often you are going to hate the very idea of God. And this is seen again and again in literature. I don't have to go into this. I'm sure that you have encountered that very simply in your life. It's always very interesting to wonder why is this person so opposed to God the Father? And very often that's where it starts. So it is a gigantic job to be the sacramental sign. And every time, every bit of failure in that arena, as a brother, as a father, as a lover, 
is going to have a profoundly harmful spiritual impact on the people who have watched this in their relationship to God. So, let's start then with the first, this first description of uh, what family is about. Be a sacramental sign of God's love through your relationship to your husband or wife. Manifest to people what God is like. It's very interesting that uh, Saint, um, Saint Vincent de Paul was so impressed with the great uh, Saint Francis, um, the one who converted innumerable Protestants right next to um, Switzerland in the uh, 17th century, Saint Francis de Sales. He was so impressed with Saint Francis de Sales that he said once to a friend, you know, God must be wonderful because Saint Francis de Sales is so wonderful. Well, this is exactly what this means, the sacramental sign. God's love must be unbelievable when you see what's going on, that spark between these two people. So that was the first one. Maybe you want to hear what the other one is. The other ones are be each other's helpmate. In other words, build something together. Build something together. Which is what, that something? A family? Not at all. What's Adam's job? Take care of the universe. That's Adam's job. Right? That's step two. And step three, procreate. Bring new human beings into the world so that there is a tomorrow and not endlessly repetition of the same boring us, right? Okay, so let's start with this love business. I don't think, well, I don't know what you're thinking, but most young people I know, and myself included when I was young, which is a long time ago, I was very, very interested in hoping to experience love, find a partner, find a partner who would love me, a partner that I would love. And that becomes your plan. I am going to find a man, I am going to find a man. So. Everybody is supposed to help. Parents are supposed to help. Your friends are supposed to help. There's a plan there. We go for it. When finally this partner is landed, hooked, what is success? And we celebrate that with these completely insane weddings, which we come out of bankrupt half the time which is not good for the family to come, actually. Well, approaching marriage and love as your ticket to happiness is extremely dangerous unless you have a real vision of what the greatness of this experience can be. In fact, I consider that a blaspheme because natural love is the root, the seed, if you want, that will eventually blossom in supernatural love, whatever you want to call it, love of God. We are not very good at describing what that is, but it's a lot more than owning somebody that nobody can take away from you unless you, if they do, you will shoot them. That is not what 
natural love is intended to blossom into. How many of you have read uh, the play of John Paul II called The Jewelers something? That's right, Jewelers Shop. Yeah, well, that's what it's about, isn't it? It's a fantastic play. You should put it on, actually. I was totally flabbergasted because I taught it one year, and the class was half worse than skeptic. <laughs> Atheist, I would say. About half. Well, they are the ones who like the play best. It is the Christians who kind of think, yeah, yeah, we know that, but love is supposed to turn into the love of God. Well, it's not what the Pope said. He didn't say it. He just showed you where love comes short and how you take it beyond. He said nothing. He doesn't come to a conclusion. It's a good play, very good play. So, how do you avoid this blaspheme, which is a very, a very post-original sin <laughs> constant? Most of us tend to approach our future partner in this rather inadequate pa fashion that you're going to get him, but it's going to be mine. He's going to be mine. So, meeting the right guy is a great gift. But as I said before, a gift is a job. And to accept that gift, to deal with it properly, demands a preparation. And that's the first thing I want to talk about. If you want to meet the right guy, remember that when you meet him, you should be prepared. That's not at all automatic. First of all, the first thing you have to learn is stop trying to get everything under control and managed. If you already know a list of what this guy has to be like, there's a good chance you will not recognize the right guy when he passes by. Because the right guy is most likely not what you think the right guy would be. You have to be open to a surprise. I mean, a real surprise when he passes by. I've seen <laughs> this so many times because I have so many grandchildren. Grandchildren tend to be furious if you give them something which is not what they wanted for Christmas. <laughs> so if you offer them for Christmas, Oh, a trip to the museum instead of a Lego set. Oh, fury, fury around it. So they miss the trip to the museum. They get nothing out of it because they are seething the whole time. Well, it's the exact same thing with your right guy. And to tell you the truth, most right guys are definitely not what you plan because God, being smart, know that what you need is not a clone of you, <laughs> so perfect as you are. It's precisely somebody who's going to shake you up and make you grow. So that's the first thing. Don't make a list of what this guy is supposed to be. And if you do make that list, don't go for it. The second thing is stop navel-gazing. And this applies extremely much for girls, but boys too fall into this problem. Stop worrying about what you look like, what you need, what you deserve, what you must cultivate about yourself. Just stop being interested in the outside world for a change. You think that's uh, easy to be interested in the outside world? Well, I don't know very many people who are interested in the outside world. One of my best examples of that, I had a roommate who was, uh, she was from Iceland. That's very unusual, eh? She was seething because nobody ever asked her one thing 
about what it's like to live in Iceland. The only thing she ever heard about Iceland was this question, do you hibernate? <laughs> so, well, good example of what I mean. Become interested in the world outside of you. Be awed by the world. Be awed what you, by what you see and love it. Not so that you can have it in your living room. Love it just for itself. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Love it. That's a very good beginning. I had a mother who uh, people were always kidding because she spent her life saying, oh, look at this. It's fantastic. Oh, did you see that? Isn't that unusual? All the time. So they called her, oh, you, have you seen this? That, your, is your mother still saying, have you seen this every 15 minutes? Well, you know, it's catching. I tell myself, say, oh, look, and then I keep, oh, I have to be careful because people don't like you to keep telling them, oh, look at this. Well, if you have not learned to look, you won't see your beloved. It's very simple. Think about it. You're going to see a potential husband can weigh on these scales. That's not this man that you're meeting. He's not a potential husband. He is him or she is her. I remember one of my daughters had a boyfriend and uh, he wasn't sure he wanted to marry her. Maybe, maybe not. And he showed me a letter that he wrote to a friend. And it went like this. This girl has this, these qualities. One, two, three, four. I said, forget this man. Forget this man. He does not have an iota of capacity for loving anyone in the world. And then, there's a few more things you need to learn. Invest in that world. Learn to be active, to develop, to participate in activities that you admire. Find your passion. It is through your passions that you will usually meet each other, as a matter of fact is through your desire to do something really worthwhile or to experience something really worthwhile that most people actually come together. I can't tell you how often I've asked to people who are thinking of getting married, so what's her passion? What's his passion? Huh? What do you mean? Well, I really don't know. You don't know what she really wants more than anything? Well, no, I never asked her, in fact. Huh? That's hardly a good beginning for marriage. There is an extension to this, which is really the same thing. Have a dream. Want more. Desire big. And then you will meet somebody who has a dream, who wants more who desires big, and who is going to launch you somewhere in the world where you never thought you would go, and where you will find lots of work, but lots of excitement. So that's my advice, premarital. <laughs> if you have, if you lack these attitudes, the good chance is that when you meet, thank God, your potential partner, you will pass each other like ships in the night. And that's tragic. Ah. I have been asked hundreds of times, do you think I have a vocation for the family? I always say, what are you talking about? Do you know somebody? No. Well, what do you mean you have a vocation for family? You don't have a vocation for family if you don't have a potential partner. The question poses itself when you come 
in contact with a potential partner. Then you have to ask yourself, am I capable of family? Do I wish to go into a family? Yes. In other words, it's when God, and I really mean that, gives you the gift of meeting the right guy. That's a gift. Take it or leave it. Don't hang around. Choose. And if you take it, you become, as Bernanos used to say, one of the heroes of the modern time. Bernanos felt that anybody who decides to found a family because this was between the World War I and World War II. Do you realize there was, what, 20 years between World War I and World War II? Can you imagine? How old are you? 20-something? If you had already seen a war and you were entering into a new one yourselves, I mean a real one where it goes home, the bombs fall on you, not on somebody else. Well, that's when Bernardo said, Anyone who found a family is the hero of modern times. And that is true. That is true. But it's not enough to decide to build a family to succeed in creating a family. And something has to be very clear from the first and throughout the whole time. The family is not a citadel in which you protect yourself from the evil outside world and make a warm nest for your kids so that all of you together can enjoy the kind of life that the people out there are definitely not going to experience. That is not a family. So that's step one. The family is the opposite. The family is a launching pad. It's a launching pad for, for explorers, for lovers, for caretakers of the world. So don't ignore that a family is not a good in itself. Families can be very sinful. Mafias are families. Think about that. And families can become mafias very easily. In other words, care about only one thing, their own survival, and the rest of the world can go to pot, if necessary. Preferably not, right? But in case it's necessary. And families are not stuffy museums either, in which you can gather all the souvenirs of your great, great, great grandparents and stuff of this type, so that forever and ever there will be memories and photographs. Thank God now they are on Facebook, so one of these days they will all be erased because the whole whole technology is going to change so much that you won't have time to transfer them to something new and that will erase all this overwhelmingly heavy museum-like record of the splendor of your family. That is not what the family is about. And the families are not cloning machines. Oh, be like your great-grandfather. No, don't be like your great-grandfather. Be you here and now. And sadly enough, you here and now is not me. Definitely not me. It's something brand new. So, how do you prepare your children to be not you, not in a cocoon, How do you prepare them for this? Well, again, I'm going... What I'm translating to you is really the fundamental project of Pope Francis 
in this encyclical. And what I'm going to quote as example or qualities, they all come from his encyclical. First thing, first thing, the family is where a child encounters the world. The physical world and the social world. If this encounter is negative, the rest of his life, this child will fail to respond with joy and gratitude to the external world, and he will fail, or she will fail, to respond with gratitude to the society in which he or she is enclosed. The experience children have of family is what predisposes them to trust the world, to look for beauty in the world, not to fear it, not to exploit it. Nothing is more important than the home you build. And I don't mean you have to spend lots of money for decoration. I mean it has to be a warm place, a lovely place, a simple place. Nothing makes up for lack of experience of nature with parents who love nature. I don't care what, camping, gardening, there's millions of ways. But this is how children learn to love the physical universe around them. If we want children not to destroy the world further than we have, these attitudes are absolutely necessary. But they are, much, they are necessary for much more important purposes. That will teach them the most important attitude in life, gratitude, thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I am in this building today. Thank you, Lord, that these people are around and interested in communicating. It's too bad you don't communicate back, so I have to talk all the time. But it's impossible in such a big group, right, to communicate much. Thank you, God, for being in Canada. Thank you, God, for being in the universe. Thank you, God, for the stars above. Thank you, God, for Lake Ontario. Thank you. You know, you can go on endlessly, but, but you have to think concretely about these thank you gods. You should be saying thank you God every minute of the day. And that's what a child in a happy family kind of spontaneously learns. This is my home. The world is my home. I am so lucky to have a home. Secondly, in the family, you learn to live in society. It is the ideal place to learn to live in a society. But it is a society that parents are extremely important in structuring in such a way that the children come out of it as splendid future citizens. How? First of all, make sure that courtesy is absolutely fundamental in your family. Everyone has to be treated with what the Pope repeatedly called tenderness. Tenderness. The sense everybody is breakable. Don't break. Be gentle. Even if you're furious, don't scream. You can go into the details. But an atmosphere of tenderness in a family is irreplaceable in the formation of a child. Just like the beauty, what I call the beauty of your house, is irreplaceable in the formation of a child. And along with this, the family must be a team. The family mustn't be a place where, oh, I'm going to do the dishes tonight because I want 25 cents. No. 
forget the 25 cents. I want to do the dishes tonight because I'm so lucky this is my night to do the dishes, so I'll be with mom and we can talk <laughs> for a good long time about everything and she can tell me to her. That's the atmosphere which you want to create in your family. And every person must feel that if they weren't there, it wouldn't work. That's the great thing, actually, about working outside of the home. When you work outside of the home, if your five kids don't help at all, you've had it. But not only you've had it, the family has had it. And pretty soon, they pick this up. I'll never forget one day one of my daughters, she was 12 or something. Friends arrived at noontime, and I had a class at 4 or something. So she said, oh, mom, don't worry. I will cook lunch for them. And the people said, what? What did she say? She did. She cooked lunch for them. In fact, she made a souffle. <laughs> and they were so flabbergasted. But that's what cooperation in a family means. It means you know this is worthwhile. This community is worthwhile. It's worthwhile being at dinner at night. Because if you're not there, there's a hole. There's a hole in the conversation. It's worthwhile for you to sweep the floor. Because frankly, mom has lost her glasses, and she doesn't notice <laughs> there's a lot of mess on this floor. It doesn't make the house so nice. So I'll sweep the floor. That's a magnificent beginning of an education. And then, be honest with your children about the fact that money doesn't fall from trees. They should be aware of your financial constraints, and they should learn to not only live with it, but kind of like it. It simplifies life not to have too much money. If you have enough, of course. If they are not overwhelmed with idiotic stuff, they will learn not to misuse or, or break things by having some beloved toy. If they have 60 teddy bears, both, one more, one less, huh? what difference does it make? So, I'd better hurry. So, I will hurry. Everything that I've told you, Pope Francis said in some way or other in that encyclical. He reminds you that it's in the family that you learn to love people that are queer. Because in the family, you've got everything. You've got babies with colic. You have grandparents with Alzheimer's. And what happens? You just love that baby, even though he's screaming all the time. That's what the parents have to achieve, that you learn to love that baby, even if he's screaming all the time, and do your best to alleviate the screaming. And the same with the grandparent. Don't try to protect your kids from bizarre people <laughs> that you take into your family. Maybe <laughs> Mark would have comments on this. Because I think he felt I introduced too many bizarre people <laughs> into our family by adopting various strange students, <clears throat> who sometimes were a little bit hard to take. But all in all, it teaches you to learn to take these things with a laugh, with a grain of salt, with an, well, you know what? This kind of adds to the family that it's not so perfect. Nothing's more boring than a perfect family. It is boring, I'll have you know. <laughs> it's also scary. Anyway, so this is the last big uh, point that Pope Francis repeatedly makes. We are forced to love strange people if we live in a loving family. There is no other way. And that's the best lesson. However, that's the beginning. That's the preparation. 
but preparation for what? The most important task of the family is to launch their children out. That's what you got them ready for. To get out in this big experiment that God is carrying out. Of course you have to believe that God is carrying out a big experiment, that life makes sense, that history makes sense, that we are expecting a kingdom. Think about that. Do you believe that you are expecting a kingdom? And this is one of the big questions Pope Francis launches. Have we given up hope? Have we given up what Christianity, what launched Christianity? Why do you think people became Christian? Because the kingdom was coming. That's the good news. And so, if we don't believe the kingdom is coming, well, maybe we don't believe the good news. And that's, sorry to tell you, the gospel. So if you don't believe the gospel, you're in, Maybe you should do something else than be a Christian. Think about it. So, our biggest duty to our children is to try to make them aware that they themselves, one by one, each of them, is going to be very soon responsible for participating in this big experiment. There's millions of ways. You can do it through science, through art, through anything through Christianity itself. I mean, through religion, the whole thing is Christianity, art, all the rest, obviously. Yes, we have to make our kids aware that what makes life worthwhile is that we have a vocation outside of the family and in the big wide world and aimed at an extraordinary conclusion that we haven't quite visualized. And if they are going to achieve that, if they are going to live in a world in process that's going somewhere, they can't repeat what we have done. The whole cosmos is in a dynamic process, says Pope Francis. We don't know, parents, what our children are called to. They will have to invent their path, step by step, by living here and now with that big hope in their heart. And if they do, if they do this gratuitously, as the Pope keeps repeating, not in order to get rich or comfortable or even happy. They will be happy. If they don't look for that happiness, they will be happy. So we are, I'm sorry, coming back here to these hurtful words of Christ. Unless you hate your father and your mother. Yeah, exactly right. Parents, let go of your treasure. Because only if you let it go will it bear fruit. And you will never understand what your children are doing. You will never understand where they are going. They don't have your vocation. It's a different one, profoundly different. It's their vocation. It's similar in many ways, but it's profoundly different in many ways. And I always think about that on the story of Parsifal. You know Parsifal? The Grail Knight? Parsifal, the story of Parsifal starts with his mother protecting him in this wonderful castle in a clearing in the forest, teaching him everything that is worthwhile, and telling him, don't go out in the world out there. That's where your father was killed. And Parsifal says, yes, mom, yes, mom. And one day he's out and he sees knights passing by in their array on their horses with their sword. 
That's what I want to be, he says. And sure enough, away he goes. His mother is so heartbroken, she falls dead on the ground. And was that wrong what he did, Parsifal? Well, it turns out that because he is remembering his mother and trying to find her again, he actually becomes the Grail Knight. Before that, he was just a knight. After that, he becomes the Grail Knight. The Grail, that's the kingdom. So, sad? Not sad. It's life. Sometimes I relate this to childbirth. Childbirth is a different experience, to say the least. To me, it was major. His birth was <laughs> my biggest experience. Because I had prepared perfectly. I had read all the books, because my mother was in France, so I had to figure it out for myself. I knew all the steps. I knew how you should breathe that your husband should be there holding your hand and all this kind of stuff. Well, what happened? The doctor said, oh no, your husband won't be here. I don't want to have to pick up a fainting husband while you're bringing a kid to life out with your husband. So, part one disappeared. I start breathing, oh my God. It didn't stop the pain at all. And then suddenly I stopped, they say, oh push, push. Oh, oh, I can't push, I can't do anything. You're like in a whirlpool. Childbirth is a whirlpool. You lose all control, and suddenly you realize, oh my goodness, the whole thing is, I let myself go to this, and it's taking over. And how wonderful it's taking over. Something amazing is happening. But what's happening? That the child is separated from you. Now, to me, that is the most beautiful, godlike human experience there is. But I'm sorry to tell you, probably you won't have it because you will get uh, an injection that will keep you from experiencing that completely. That's okay. <laughs> <There's> the <laughs> okay. So. Where is this going? Well, you, if you start a family, will consecrate years of your life, all the best years of your life. You will consecrate them. In other words, sacrifice them. It's the same thing. You will make them holy. That's what sacrifice is, with all the overtones to the formation of children, so they will be stewards of God's plan for the universe. Not for me, not for you, for every person on the earth. So, what about you? Well, make sure you have taught them, as the Pope says, teach them to say please. That not feeling entitled. Please teach them to say thank you. That's being grateful for everything. Please teach them to say forgive me. That is knowing how to convert daily from your harmful mistakes. And then it's on their shoulder. They will help build the kingdom in their ways, <coughs> very unexpected ways. And what is that? That is doing the will of the Father. What did Christ say? My family? Is that my father? Is that my mother? It's those who do the will of my Father. So through the sacrament of your family, your children will have become Jesus' family, and 
in the same process, you will have done the will of the Father and become Jesus' family. And so you find your kids again, not as your kids, not as my children, as your brothers and sisters. And that's the end of my talk. If you have any questions, now would be the time to ask. Um, I would just request, just so that um, we could e easily facilitate the translation process, that uh, you go to the South Anvil right there and use that microphone to ask your questions. That's a good idea because I'm deaf, <laughs> being old, <laughs> not voluntarily. That's a failure of a talk. <laughs> Nobody has a question. <laughs> Everybody overwhelmed. <laughs> Drowning. Thank you so much for your talk this evening. I just have a question about how to, um, your take on how to raise children in this ever increasing technological world that we're living in, where um, I see many parents babysitting their children by giving them an iPad um, to entertain them for hours and hours. So just if you could speak to that a little bit. Well, the problem with the iPad most of the time, is that it does enclose you and uh, isolate you, precisely the opposite of what an education is supposed to do. By the way, what does it mean, educate? X, out of, do cherry, lead. Educate is lead kids out of themselves into reality, right? The iPad can be a tool. Usually, it's very often, it's an obstruction. So, what do you do? I think, to begin with, if your kid is busy enough, the time for the iPad is going to shrink. And this relates to what I was telling you about uh, making sure each child in a family has a real position, a real job, a real responsibility that the child has recognized as, I'm pretty good because, you know, I am the one who does this, that, the other thing. So I think making sure that the real activities are activities. There is nothing wrong with relaxing. I mean, we're worried about the iPad, but what did we do in my days? We listened to these completely idiotic songs. I remember I knew <laughs> the, they never experienced that, but they were the best ten, the best ten songs which everybody knew. I don't know hardly any song today that three kids in one room really know from the beginning and the end. We all knew these ten songs. We spent endless amount of time learning so stupid, stupid ideas like, uh, oh, I don't, <laughs> don't, don't cry, Joe, let her go, <laughs> that kind of thing. What was so much better than the iPad? Nothing much. You do have to relax. You do have to be stupid once in a while. That's fine. The whole issue is what proportion of the time. And the second question is, where is the iPad leading you? In other words, what are you doing when you're on there? And that needs to be supervised, if possible. And if you let it start, you're doomed. Because it is definitely an addiction, and fighting anybody's addiction is no joke, as anybody knows who has had addicted children. Does that answer at all?
Thank you, Dr. Langan, so much for your talk. It's amazing. I was actually just wondering if you could give us any suggestions on how to cultivate wonder. Because you're talking about being in awe and wonder at creation and different things. But so if you have any suggestions of how to go about cultivating wonder. Oh. The first thing is, you have to yourself wonder. I mean, that's step one. You have to notice things. My mother, as I told you, she's constantly, she was telling us, oh, did you notice how this rabbit lifted his ear and dropped it back down? And you know what he's doing? <laughs> he's responding to this noise. Did you hear that noise? No. Well, there was a noise. Didn't you hear it? Listen again. And then that's how you develop wonder. Wonder, any time you really look at something, really look, it's beyond astonishing. Life is incredibly astonishing. People's strange ways of thinking, if you're really listening to what they are saying, are really astonishing. How can these people think like that? Wow! I never, never would have even entered into this thought process. But you have to notice what Simone Weil called attention. She said, attention is the path to heaven. And what she meant by that is if you really try to see what's there, you'll end up loving what's there. I mean, that sounds baloney, but try it and then you'll see. That's the best way to find out. Hi, Dr. Langdon again. Um, thank you for your talk. So, um, a couple weeks ago in Philadelphia, Pope Francis quoted um, Father Patrick Payton's thing, the family that prays together stays together. I was just wondering, based on your own practical experience, if you could give some practical tips for cultivating prayer life within a family. Oh, uh, that... I don't know why... It's certainly true that praying together, and there's many ways to pray together, is probably the most powerful link the only thing is you have to understand what prayer means. I think our links to each other, and that may be strange, but it certainly is true, I think, of married people, at least of my marriage. Two married people, in a funny way, meet in God. In other words, that's where they can't fight. That's what they both try to reach, let be, and this awareness of, I don't care what I think or what you think, we have to figure out what's right here. What does it mean, what's right here? What's right here means, literally, the will of the Father. That's what it means. And that's why it's hard to find out. That's why you can't deduce it from some intelligent ethics that calculates the pros and the cons, adds it all up, weighs, and then decides. Right? So, that's one level of prayer. This awareness that at all times, in your fights, in your agreements, you have to be doing together the will of the Father. The same applies with your kids. You don't force your kids to do what you like. You try to help your kids do what's right. And it's the same thing all over again. What's right is not what I want, what I like, what uh, my grandfather did. It's what is the will of the Father for that child. This is a kind of constant prayer life in which you are always aware that 
God's watching. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, because whichever way you say it makes it sound stupid. That's the problem with religion, of course. It always sounds stupid when you say it. Now, besides this, we can go into the nitty gritty detail. One of my daughters, who, um, who fell in love with a Jewish guy, and supposedly he fell in love with her, which I doubt thoroughly, but anyway, she thought he was in love with her, and he said, look, I definitely want to marry you, but you have to become Jewish. So she said, well, I am Jewish. Any Christian is Jewish. That's the way we see it in our family. So he said, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> no Christ. No Christ. If you are Jewish, you do not believe in Christ. So that was pretty hard. And finally, she decided to say no. And later on, she told me, you know, Mom, what gave me the strength to say no? I said I was expecting some really deep spiritual color. It's our preparations for Christmas. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> she said, well, I can't explain it, but it's our preparation for Christmas. We worked so hard to prepare Christmas. It was such a wonderful experience to see it come, little by little. It was so wonderful to actually actualize the Christmas. Everything, the Mass, the dinner after the Mass, the singing together, the lights in the house. That's why I didn't marry him. I, <laughs> oh my God. And this girl is very bright. <laughs> so, the reason I'm saying this is to show you that you can say all you want about uh, pieties. And I've given you both extremes, right? There's the profound being in prayer, and the other extreme, doing those superficial external things, which are not superficial external. They are what catches your body into your soul, right? And so, I, first of all, I think, missing church on Sunday is more than horrible. It is one of the worst things you can do for your children. Think, oh, the poor kid, you know, they can't sit so long. Give me a break. I've seen kids one year old sit so long. And if they make noise, very good. They go across there and can scream in the next house and come back. There is nothing that brings a family together, even the people who don't believe anymore who think they don't believe anymore, because that's always something. Don't classify people and decide who believes and who does not believe. There's a lot of people who think they don't believe, and somewhere deep down, they still believe. That's their problem, not yours. But what's for sure is they do believe or not. Come to church just to make you happy. And it's a wonderful family experience because they've done something really nice for you which is go to that church which is so boring but grandma is so happy <laughs> so that's fine another thing is don't accept to go for pathetic services it is destructive of your kids faith to be to enter into the experience of Christianity through abominable Sunday Masses. Once you're installed in Christianity, it doesn't matter. You don't need anything. The Eucharist is enough. But it takes a while before, to you, the Eucharist is enough. Just as in concentration camp, you didn't need bread, you didn't need wine, you managed. You didn't need an altar, you didn't need anything. You just needed the priest consecrating whatever little tiny thing he could get his hands on. But when you're young, that's not the way it is. And if you are introduced into the splendor of this Eucharist by botched masses, 
you are harming your kids. I can't tell you how much <laughs> we are running around trying to find which mass would be inspiring in Toronto. And we did run around. <laughs> in fact, the poor guys, <laughs> they used to, we used to take them to uh, Easter midnight mass. And once, because one of the students had said, oh, a mass in, uh, at TST is so magnificent. So we went to this mass, and indeed, it was magnificent. What did it last, four hours or something? Literally, I'm not exaggerating. They had split all the readings. They did all the readings, not three, four, seven, and then two more after. And then they had split the first reading, which is Genesis, into the days. So there was the first day, to, uh, and then music, and, uh, explanation. Second day, music. <laughs> Oh my goodness, well, you should have seen them. They were all lying on the floor. <laughs> but was that a good or a bad memory? <laughs> I don't know, but it's certainly anchored in there, I can tell you. <laughs> they didn't forget what a midnight mass was like at Easter. So all this is part of prayer. Another absolutely vital prayer is the benedicite, blessings for all, whatever, whichever way you do it. Every single meal, because that carries, it's very strange. It carries everywhere, it carries in the restaurant, it carries in your own family, even if you don't believe that much. It's kind of nice to get together and thank God for something, whatever you think God is. No waste, that's very, very useful. Now, I don't know if Mark remembers, but we, I tried for many years to have a serious after-dinner night prayer. And the idea was everybody was supposed to say something that they were thankful for and something that they were sorry for around the table. Well, my husband, <laughs> who, he was very, very serious Catholic. But it bored him beyond belief, the separation. And so he chuckled every single night through a little joke here and there. My husband could not resist throwing a little joke. It ruined completely <laughs> my night prayer. <laughs> so I kind of gave up. But every family has his or her own way. And I think that all of these family praying together in various ways is obviously vital for keeping the family together, but that's not the end. The end is not to keep the family together, it's to scatter the family <laughs> to the world with love for the mother, father, whoever <laughs> that they've left behind, way behind. Uh, sorry for English speaking. <laughs> um, je, ouais, je vais parler euh, en français parce que je sais que Janine va me comprendre un peu aussi. Euh, Janine, au fait, je pense que euh, tu nous as parlé pas mal des attentes qu'il faut euh, qu'il faut avoir quand on est marié et tout. Euh, J'ai beaucoup écouté euh, des amis euh, pour, sur leur expérience dans le mariage et puis après les enfants, après les années de couple. Et là, je me posais la question à savoir, euh, parce que souvent on parle de la flamme qui disparaît à un moment donné et qui peut jaillir à un, à un moment donné. Et euh, cette flamme qui disparaît à un moment donné, peut-être que c'est l'amour qui finit, peut-être qu'on ne sent plus trop comme au début. Comment vous, par votre expérience, ça s'est passé pour refaire jaillir ça, euh, surtout quand, quand on a l'occupation des enfants, on a aussi euh, les, le poids de, des années, comment vous, avez, comment vous avez pu maintenir cette flamme ou, euh, pour parvenir à tenir votre couple Ou comment, quels sont les outils qu'il faut avoir Je ne sais pas si je me fais comprendre, Janine oh. <laughs> Merci. Oh, 
I'm trying to think how it works in our family. Because all I can say is my own personal experience, and that's not universal, eh? that's our own personal experience. I know that what kept my husband and myself so close, I always used to say that to him, you know what, we are two oxen tied to the same plow, and that's why we're doing fine. <laughs> and that's very true. I think both of us had the same fundamental ultimate goal. And working at it is one of the major things that kept us together. Plus, my husband has a, sorry to tell you, a fantastic sense of humor. And that is one of the most wonderful uh, way of liberating again something spontaneous, right? something that comes when you laugh, you're not thinking hard. It just explodes. You become a kid again. And when you become a kid again, kind of your love as a kid comes up along with it. I mean, you forget how bored you were, right? And suddenly, you're not bored anymore by this guy whom you know so well and you never expected he would come up with a stupid joke at this important moment. <laughs> and you forgiven. Now, obviously, I can't tell you, make sure you marry only a guy with a good sense of humor, but it certainly helped. And you could be the gal with a good sense of humor. It doesn't have to be the other person. Now, that sounds like a stupid answer, but it certainly was a true answer for us. Those two things were absolutely vital to keeping us uh, going. And good fights. Now, I always say we never had fights. Our neighbor, when they told me, oh, I'm so glad you live next door to us, because you shout <laughs> as loud as we do. And what was bad is our neighbors were divorcing. <laughs> so I thought, oh my God, <laughs> what are we doing? But I always say, we were not fighting, we were arguing. Because he was a professor, I was a professor, and we were going to come out with some kind of a common conclusion. And let me tell you, trying to get my husband to listen to what you said implied that you had to shout, <laughs> you really did, to interrupt him. My kids once gave him a, a poster that said, how can you talk when I am interrupting. <laughs> and that's really, well, yeah, because he, he knew he had something to give to the world and he wanted to give it. But sometimes the world wanted to get back <laughs> in there, here and there. And so that's why our conversation went up, up, up. But they weren't fights, really. We weren't angry. We were just intense. And that, what saved us there is that I'm French, and the French love to argue about nothing. I mean, if, if they don't disagree, they will invent a disagreement. <laughs> because it makes life more interesting. Discussing is what life is all about. So, Tom like that. I was born like that. So the two of us never got mad when we argued. We just argued more and more viciously to make our point, cheating sometimes. Well, if you can avoid cheating, it's better. That's part of the solutions. Okay. I have three things. One, um, you're a very good talker, and I like your jacket. It's pretty nice. Oh, my sister gave me that. Oh, yeah? It's pretty yeah. fresh. Um, uh, two, Growing up in this day and age, um, I know people that are like pretty young, uh, they're faced with uh, like dealing with a, f a very flashy culture. So I'm wondering, I mean, obviously you're only like what, like 10 years older than me, so you're not that much older than me. But what I'm saying is that um, back in your day, what did you think, like was society as, not corrupt, but as flashy as it is today, like back in your day? Well. 
I mean, it wasn't that long ago. It was like 20 years. To tell you the truth, it was not a very nice society because when I was a kid, Hitler had run over France and between the age of eight and, I don't know, 12, right? We were under the Nazi boot. And it wasn't that easy to figure out how you should respond to that situation. Really, it was not easy. And even though everybody thinks that, oh, Hitler, you know, he had horns and a tail, and it was most obvious what a horrendous character he was. Well, propaganda works well. It works well in Canada, too, you know. As we are seeing every time anything political occurs in Canada, propaganda works. And Hitler's propaganda was brilliant. And you should have seen all the supposedly nice people who cooperated with the Nazis for various reasons, ideological, <coughs> hatred, interest, you know, making it big, not losing their job, and then you were surprised to see who the, were the people who did not go with the Nazis, and very often, they were people that you wouldn't have talked to before. What? Very interesting. It's, it's the less perfect deep. the people, probably the more honest about the situation. So let me tell you, the world in my youth was not sensational. And let me also tell you that I don't know what you think about Vatican II, but the church before Vatican II was not better than the church after Vatican II. Okay, and then the third thing, last thing, you were talking about all these girls looking for like the perfect guy or whatever, and, the guy and he's standing right here, so that's it. <laughs> Sense of humor, step one. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I was very happy to be here. Now, my son is giving me dinner. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Langan, for sharing your experiences and advice about creating a culture of vocations within the family. On behalf of the Newman Center and all the students and community members gathered here, we really enjoyed and learned a lot from you.